Today on City Cash Chicago, after 50 plus years of promises, plans to extend the red line past 95th Street are starting to actually look well promising. CTA is hopeful federal funding for the $3.6 billion project will come together. Neighborhood development plans are moving through city council and three construction finalists were selected earlier this month. So after all these decades, what would the red line extension mean for the far south side? It's Monday, June 26th. I'm Jacoby Cochran, and this is what Chicago's talking about. All right, check it. The extension would go from 95th Street to 130th Street in All Gale Gardens, adding four new stops at 103rd, 111th, 115th, and 130th. It would also come with a new train yard, park and ride facilities, and connection for pedestrians and bikers. Andrea Reed heads up the Greater Roseland Chamber of Commerce, and she's been a big advocate for more transit on the far south side. Tanisha Marshall is CTA's VP of the Red Line Extension Project. Welcome to City Cash Chicago. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Andrea, I want to start with you. What would having the Red Line further into the far south side mean for you and your neighbors, especially in a neighborhood like Roseland? Well, you know, Roseland has been a community that has been disinvested for decades. And one of those things was a lack of transportation. Giving people an option, an opportunity to get to the resources that they, that they need. I consider it a quality of life issue. When you, you know, you don't have transportation to get to jobs and you don't have uh, the opportunity to get to fresh foods, even to, just to go to the doctor, you know, um, these are things that can really impact the quality of life for individuals. So having the red line extension uh, finally come through is a game changer. Mm -hmm. We've had so many talks on CityCast about the importance of transit-oriented development. That's affordable housing. That's local infrastructure, small businesses that are built around transportation hubs. But when we start talking about the far south side, the far southeast side, whether it's Hegwish, whether it's Roseland, whether it's Pullman, it's hard to talk about transit oriented development when you ain't got no transit. What specifically would neighbors have access to on the far south side that is just difficult to reach now? Well, as you know, most of the jobs are north of here. So it's just having access to those jobs. And then with this infrastructure coming into our community, the other fight that I have is to make sure that the people that live in Roseland have the opportunity to get those jobs that are going to be created. So, and then access to training facilities, um, they need to be local. We don't want to see this major investment come into the Roseland community and the people that live here not have access to those jobs that are going to be created. So yeah. we, we're actually behind time. This, this is something that we should have been working on far before now. Most of our businesses in Roseland, they commute here an hour to two hours every day. And so when, when they close their doors at five o'clock, all of the revenue that's earned leaves this community. So we need to change that trajectory. We need people to have opportunity to earn money, have the opportunity to afford to buy a home. Therefore, the money and the revenue that's generated stays local. Yes, ma'am. I grew up spending weekends with my cousins in the gardens. I mean, just this past weekend, I went to a barbecue out on 120th and State. And you know, as you're driving towards deeper and deeper into the far south side, It's not just transit that gets cut off, but you start to see grocery stores disappear, right? Entertainment facilities disappear. The number of vacant lots that pop up. Tanisha, I want to bring you in here. Do you have a sense of how many people who live in the far south side, the far southeast side, have to either commute to 95th Street to use the red line or who have to find alternative transportation options because the red line is just a little bit of a challenge to get to. The benefits will extend beyond the whole entire city. Like 
Currently, 24% of the RLE project area residents live below the poverty level. This uh, extension actually now takes a person's commute, reduces it by 30 minutes, where it would take them like several transfers just to get downtown. More than 23% of um, households in the project area lack access to automobiles. So now we'll be able to provide and bridge that gap. Yeah. How many people do you think these four stops will be able to serve once it's open and, and, and moving? I, I would say that the numbers are endless, right? You can look at all of the communities. But you also think about the people that are uh, potentially coming from the suburbs. Now that we'll have park and ride facilities where they can come into 130th or um, 100 Michigan Avenue near 116th or at 111th or 103rd. So you'll get an influx of not just the community, but also people who might live in the suburbs who want to tra use transit as a means of transportation into the city. For sure. My mother, I remember we lived in Chicago Heights uh, for a few years at the end of high school, and my mom would just drive to the metro station and then take her long commute. Tanishi, I want to back up a little bit, right? This project has had great momentum since about 2020, but how long have we really been talking about extending the red line? So you've been talking about it probably for over 60 years, right? But I'm happy to say, like, we entered into the project development phase um, at the end of 2020. Since then, we had our transit TIF get approved by city council, which will afford us up to $959 million worth of dollars to fund this. And now we're moving into our engineering phase. Once we get into engineering phase, now we'll be able to bring on designers and uh, contractors. We'll start construction, which is slated for late 2025, and it'll go through late 2029. We're always putting you on local hits here at CityCast Chicago, and your boy has got another one for you. Revolution Brewing is the largest independently owned brewery in Illinois, and this summer, you gotta try their Freedom Lemonade. Basically, it's lemonade, but with ale instead of water. Yeah, you're starting to picture it. At just 4.5% ABV, it's a great option for anyone enjoying the day outdoors, even if you're not usually into beer. You can find it at Revolution Brewing's Tap Room in Avondale or the original brew pub in Logan Square or wherever else Revolution Beer is sold. And be sure to check out their other Chicago-made offerings at RevBrewing.com. That's R-E-V Brewing.com. Andrea, I want to come back to you. How long have you been hearing about the red line extension in your own life? And what feels different about what's been going on since 2020 versus the talks and plans we might have been hearing for decades prior? Well, we did have the, you know, the the starts and stops. And um, when I got involved was in 2009. And that's when um, the alderman had appointed me to start the chamber uh, back in April of 2009. Then all of a sudden, it just fell to the wayside. But, you know, we were still working on different aspects of it within the community. They kept trying to study the thing. They would have studied the thing to death. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, yeah, let's take the book off the shelf and open it up and implement the things that you've been studying. We see the impact of the lack of certain resources and the impact it has had on our community where uh, our city has been impacted the most is on the south and west side. But they also know from their studies that all the jobs and opportunities are north of here. So, I mean, hello, <laughs> it's blaring. One of, and, and one of the easiest, you know, maybe in terms of not in terms of the actual construction project, but one of the easiest ways to connect people across the city, to connect people on the far south side to these opportunities and to these jobs is to give them transportation, is to literally connect them. Uh, Tanisha, I want to bring you in here. Um, we all know we've had having this conversation, having access to transportation could be a big boom for a neighborhood. But there are some people who are worried about being displaced in the process. Right. You know, to to take on a major construction project like this in a neighborhood, there are likely going to be properties that need to be bought, right? People who have to be moved. First off, the CTA has a team of acquisition relocation specialists who actually work with any property owners along that corridor. We also did a preferred alignment so that we were able to impact fewer residents 
and we only were able to acquire a lot that were vacant, not necessarily occupied by residents. So through this preferred alignment, it reduced that number. Uh, but yes, there were still some that we had to acquire properties. People were living there, but fair market value was also offered. Ms. Ms. Reed, I want to bring you back in here because let's just be real. Investment has evaded these communities, not simply because of a lack of train stops. It's also because mostly black people live in these neighborhoods. And regardless if we are south of 95th or we are north of 95th, we know that black neighborhoods, particularly on the south and the west sides, have to fight for every investment dollar they get. We've been talking about this for 50 years. Miss Reed, when you talk to your neighbors, how can you convince them that this promise is different? This time is different. It is a challenge because, you know, what people ask me, what kind of business am I in? I tell them I'm in the mind changing business because it is it's a mindset that people have come become complacent to the fact or the, the think the thought process of it is what it is. This is the way it is. And that is not true. It is how it is what we make it. Um, but currently we have people who, again, who commute here every day to do business. And when I've done my research on on where they live and the communities that they come from, we're looking at South Barrington and Naperville and with Netka and, you know, they come here to make their money. But yet when they leave and close their doors, they take every dime out of here. So when you look at the abandoned homes based on the predatory lending that occurred, a lot of people uh, lost their homes. Uh, all of those homes uh, add to the tax base if there were uh, people that live here that were homeowners. So we are working on those things. There's a lot of things that have to come together in tandem. We have to also get more people that live in the community, own a business, own a home. Therefore, the money stays in the community. And so right now I'm working really, really hard for engagement due to, you know, to get our community aware of this opportunity and get them into a apprentice program with some type of training where they can take have access to this opportunity, that it doesn't just come and go. Miss Reed. I completely understand where you come from, especially trying to look at this from a, you know, all sides perspective. But you know, the impact that is facing these communities isn't just the lack of a red line, but it's generations of redlining, right? This situation was created through policy decisions that go beyond how residents choose to engage with their neighborhood, whether it's through periods of trying to bring in business or home ownership. And so the solution to this you know, obviously is beyond neighbors taking pride in their neighborhoods, neighbors returning to their neighborhood. It's also be about creating a precedent of policy that invest. And beyond simply expanding the red line, the goal is to also build up the residential corridors, the business corridors within about a half mile from every single stop. Is It feels like the construction part we can understand, we can study, we can control. How much control do you think we have over building up the pockets of community that surround these stops? And will that be on the same timeline as the 2025, 2029 construction? Or is that sort of further down the road? Well, you know, we also have the um, Rosen Medical District, which is is also a big game changer for this community. And, and it's going to attract uh, a lot of uh, resources and opportunities for Rosen. It's like everything working in tandem. Mm -hmm. We're also looking at how can we attract more entrepreneurs, more people that live in the community that want to have a business but just don't have the capital that they need. I'm part of the Rosen Rising team, and um, one of the sites is the Rosen Theater that we're looking at if we're selected, if, if we win the bid, we uh, want to turn the Rosen Theater into an entrepreneur training center. We've had these workshops. People have had workshops for years, how to write a business plan, um, how to clean up your credit, all of these things. And then once they get home, because I've surveyed some of our participants, and they're like, well, Miss Reed, I, I want to do this, but I don't know the first thing to put on the paper. So we're going to do more coaching, more hands-on, so that people will get the that hands-on experience to get them to that next level. 
And then once they're ready, we want to be able to have affordable space to put them into uh, their own business and create a sustainable environment for them. Tanisha, I want to bring you here for a similar question, right? How much investment are we putting into this to make sure it's sustainable long term? Right. So if you remember, I talked about the Transit Supportive Development Plan that was um, just adopted last month with city council. So as part of this project, we conducted a transit supportive development study to identify economic development opportunities, including greater ridership for the transit system, um, added support for local restaurants and retail, also increased public and private sector engagement and investments, and also improved safety for pedestrians and cyclists. So this plan is just like a framework for help bringing in equitable transit-oriented development around the future RLA stations. One of the things we're seeing around development in South Shore and Woodlawn as the presidential center comes in, which, again, I think many residents in the city of Chicago are excited for, excited to see this library, this community center. But the biggest question many residents have is when nice things happen in my neighborhood, it means it's not for me and my black ass is soon going to be pushed out of this neighborhood. How do we guarantee that residents from past 95th Street out to 130th in the gardens don't don't face this imminent pressure that says when you start to see construction, when you start to see development, when you start to see Starbucks, that means you're going to have to leave soon. So with at CTA, we're, we actually have a robust workforce system and we've hired some workforce partners. Um, we're waiting to execute that contract and through that we'll offer free apprenticeship programs and also just soliciting the neighborhood as far as what careers or interests that the community may have. And it's not just specifically for the red line work. It could be with anywhere along the um, CTA system. So we are trying to engage with the community to ensure that we are providing these type of op opportunities for them to have jobs. Um, during construction, we anticipate up to 2,500 new jobs on an annual basis. And even after construction, up to 700 new jobs. So hopefully by providing these opportunities to the different community members um, will be able to ensure that live and work and it's all cohesive together. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to rattle the cage a little bit. So we put the responsibility a lot on other people outside of the community to provide the resources and opportunities that we need. But we as a community and the individuals that are here, have to begin to take personal responsibility as well. The biggest challenge that I have to build retail on Michigan Avenue is, is not the, the people that come here uh, that have the businesses here, but the negative activity that's going on every day. When people don't know if they should get out of their cars, they don't feel safe to, to, to shop or to come to the corridor because of, of what's going on there. So, we got to look internal as well. We can't just look at all the outside sources and say, oh, they're cutting us off from this and they're cutting us off for that. We got to look at when do we take ownership and responsibility to do our part. And I hear what you're saying there. And while I, you know, while I advocate for, you know, neighborhoods and neighborhood members to sort of build communities they want, I do wonder in this, not simply this case, but when we have these conversations, this this battle between personal responsibility and holding the system accountable, right? Th there is a sort of mixed pressure there, right? Sure, residents can take uh, more ownership over their neighborhood, but residents don't have millions and billions of dollars to invest in beautification and uplifting neighborhoods and bringing in businesses. They're sort of playing the cards that they were dealt and they were born into communities that they told were forgotten. So how do we balance that conversation to make sure it isn't a, let's just blame, you know, the corner boys in our neighborhood for, for our neighborhood's lack of access? Because I don't think it's the corner boys who boarded up those houses, right? We can't go back. Mm -hmm. We can't go back in the past and, and, and change what has occurred. But we can move forward. There's got to be change on both sides. Mm -hmm. Tanisha, obviously the plan is laid out. We have the dates. Uh, but are there any significant roadblocks that could hamper this project from moving forward? Because if everything from construction on the highways to building of major developments cautions people that, sure, 
We'd love to open in 2029, but, you know, we, we have to be realistic. So are there any major roadblocks to watch out uh, with this project? Roadblocks, no. I say that we have put ourselves in a very good position to acquire additional funding from um, FTA. Um, we are seeking 60 percent funds from the FTA. So I think we'll probably arrive somewhere close to that. Most recently, you know, the federal government, um, Congress appropriated 350 million tourists. So right now we're just doing we're taking care of all the steps in, in order to acquire this additional funding that will be required to finish this project. Uh, one more thing, you know, how can people stay engaged to this project? I like to say we're on a world tour right now. <laughs> like <laughs> We have so many touch points. We hosted our Meet the Contractors. So right now, those three prime contractors that are kind of, you know, bidding this project, they'll get the RFP, which is the request for proposals. They'll get that here in the next few weeks. We have another one coming up in July 18th to meet the contractors. We have a um, workforce outreach at Kirian Center. Um, and I always tell people, please go to our website. Our website is full of information. It tells you like the upcoming um, opportunities that are out there, whether it be work or even where you might want to go to some of these workshops. So Beautiful. go to our web website, transitchicago.com. Specifically, if you want to do a uh, red line extension, transitchicago.com slash RLE. And Ms. Reed, my final question is to you, you know, 54 years, people have been talking about this extension. And I think one thing we should make very clear is this was not handed to residents. This is not being gifted to the far south side. This has been fought for for decades and decades. What do you want people who don't travel past 95th Street to know about the grit and the determination of the far south side as we continue to to rebuild them? Well, you know, as we talked about a little bit about the um, corner boys, not uh, looking at them to, to, to judge them or to hold them wholly responsible. We understand that there was um, gross disinvestment that, was, that caused a lot of this to happen. And with that disinvestment, it impacted our schools. It impacted the community overall with, you know, um, uh, the, the homes, so people had to walk away from their homes. And so all of these things have had a trickle down effect. But now we're in a we're in the trajectory now where we're, we're moving forward and we're looking at being more proactive. And with that, uh, I've uh, I'm working closely with the public defender's office. Uh, I'm working with them to actually have an office on Michigan Avenue with their violence interruption team, that we could do some some proactive work, boots on the ground. We're looking at doing pop-up activities. We have our, our Shop Roseland event, where we had, um, last year we had over 60 vendors, you know, and I also want to say that CTA has been a great partner, and I'm looking forward to all the, the great work that we'll continue to do. They certainly are making a significant change, and they have been totally invested. So they're not going anywhere. And if I have anything to do with it, they won't. Because <laughs> I'm going to keep running my mouth. <laughs> Andrea Ree is the executive director of the Greater Roseland Chamber of Commerce. And Tanisha Marshall is the VP of the Red Line Extension Project with the CTA. Thank you all so much for joining CityCast Chicago. Thank you for having us. Thank you. I appreciate it. Before I let you go, a little bit of news, y'all. Traffic might even be slower this week as President Joe Biden is expected in town Wednesday with plans to deliver an economic address and attend a fundraiser with Governor Pritzker and his family. DraftKings Sportsbook will open a bar and restaurant tomorrow in Lakeview at Wrigley Field with plans to add retail sports betting upon approval from the Illinois Gaming Board. And some good news. Tomorrow night at 6 p.m., The Hideout is hosting Hear My Story, an evening with Chicago drag performers. You'll enjoy storytelling and performances from three Chicago drag artists. The event is free, and you can check the show notes for a link. 
As always, we appreciate you for listening, but make sure you're reading along with our daily newsletter, Hey Chicago, at chicago.citycast.fm. Our newsletter editor, Sydney Madden, has everything you need to know about NASCAR this weekend in today's newsletter. Hey, if you want to let us know how you feel about this weekend's event, please reach out to us at 773-780-0246. Leave us a text or voicemail with your name, your neighborhood, and how you feel about it, whether you hate it or love it, and you could hear yourself on the podcast. We'll be here bright and early tomorrow. We'll talk to you then. Peace. You said National Monument. I thought you were talking about old-fashioned donuts for a second. Well, I was that like, too, that's, that's a true monument right there. Let's be real.